Could, could I ask you on, on that uh, specifically, Dr. Keenan, and your own study in terms of, of the modelling regarding the, uh, the lowest 40 per cent? And you were saying that the auto enrolment doesn't really have an impact on them because they're under that income threshold of the 20,000. Most of the income, a lot of the people within that cohort, is not uh, employment income as well. Now, we have heard evidence from the insurance industry in various guises who have argued strongly that that threshold of 20% should be reduced. Uh, I think they've given the example of the UK where it's 20, where it's 10,000 pounds sterling and that they're even considering reducing that down to 7,000 pounds uh, sterling. Uh, and the Department of Social Protection have made the opposite argument that in relation to that cohort under €20,000 of income, the most important pension for them is the state contributory pension, and the investment in that is really where the focus needs to be. And this is an issue that is, uh, the members have raised previously is an issue of concern. Can I ask you in terms of the modelling that you've done in relation to those uh, of thresholds, if we were to reduce that threshold from 20,000 down, have you done that modelling or can you do that modelling? Can you give the committee an indication, you know, if we reduce down the threshold from 20,000 to 15,000 or 10,000, what would be the outcome in relation to that? That's my first question. My second question then is more, I think, to, to Dr. Rowntree. And it's coming back to the case you've made, and I think you've made it very well, and I think you've given this committee a lot of food for thought uh, in, in terms of the evidence you've provided us. But in terms of the issue of portability, one of the biggest challenges that we have in terms of the state contributory pension is workforce participation. Now, we've seen a phenomenal increase in that during COVID because there was more options in terms of flexibility. The reality is that if we want to increase incrementally over time and deal with the potential pension deficit in relation to the state contributory pension, if we can increase workforce participation rates, that will have a dramatic impact on that. And one of the ways to do that is flexible working. Now, you, I think, have referenced, you know, the auto enrolment as being a potential barrier, or could be potentially a barrier to move between employments. Could it also be a barrier to move between full-time and part-time work or between mixed part-time uh, employers as well? And my question is that could we inadvertently, through an auto-enrolment system that cannot be blended with an occupational pension system because of the way the taxation is structured, that we could end up in creating barriers to flexible employment and barriers to workforce participation that could cause us financial problems down the road in terms of the social insurance deficit by 2070-2075? I know that's a, a very broad scope question, but if maybe Dr. Keane might come in and Dr. Owntree can, can muddle over that one. Sure, for a yeah, so we, we did actually look at an alternative income cutoff of 14,000. Yes. Uh, so this was work that we did for the Department of Social Protection because they were trying to figure out what's the sort of appropriate income cutoff. First of all, it's, it's, I suppose it's hard to compare with the UK because average wages are lower there and average pensions are lower there. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that people have an adequate replacement rate so yeah. that the income they get in retirement is you know, roughly a, a similar to, yeah. um, to what they were getting while they were working. And that's probably even more important for people on lower incomes because if I'm on a higher income, then maybe I've got my mortgage paid off and I have more discretionary spending and I can cut back a bit more. Whereas people on lower incomes, if they're relying just on the state pension to cover their costs, mm. they may need to have you know, more. So sort of 70 or 80 percent of your income is sort of what we think of as a sort of adequate or a high enough replacement rate. So if we look at the state pension, um, you're talking around 15, 14, 15,000 a year. Um, uh, so and there, you, know, you don't have to pay tax on that if you don't have an occupational pension. So compared to someone who was getting 20,000 before, it's probably you know, roughly adequate. So making someone who's on 14 or 15,000 contribute in the short term, that may be harder for them. So having to pay that 6% uh, charge, that may 
you know, people on lower incomes may have even more affordability issues than people on higher incomes. Um, so it's very hard to, to pick, you know, what is the best level. But if we go too low, then we're taking money from people all the time when they're working. And then they're getting the state pension, which is probably an adequate amount for them anyway. So I think that's probably, you know, we could maybe be slightly lower, but it's important as well to note that people can opt in. So if I'm below 20,000, but I feel that I want to have, you know, a top up to my state contributory pension over my lifetime, then I can opt in as well. And what you imagine will happen is generally people's earnings rise over time. So just because I'm on 20,000 now when I'm 18 or 19 or 20 doesn't mean that I'm, I'm, I'm probably not going to be on that for the rest of my life. Um, so I'll probably get auto-enrolled in the future as well. So once having that opt in option where people can decide, well, actually, yes, I can take a 6% hit to my, my current income um, for the longer term. Um, I think that's, you know, I think 20,000 is probably a realistic um, and a, pr a roughly appropriate level. Um, obviously, it would have to be monitored over time as, as incomes rise. Um, but I think people being able to opt opt in and pay into that themselves if they want to is, is important. And can, can you provide us with that, that modelling on, on the Sure, yeah, the, I can send you the, I can send on the, the publication. I think it's, I think it's maybe footnoted the, the in the... plain English the, version now, not, plain English. You not can the just economics read, version, please. I, so what we did was we looked at if people under 40, between 14 and 20,000 were to be auto-enrolled. Again, we see very little impact on poverty, going back to the fact that those people may be on low enough individual income, but we tend to find them higher up the income distribution. So they could be students or younger people living with parents, or they could have a partner who's got a higher income. So even with that lower income cutoff, we didn't see um, any real significant impact on poverty rates. Thank you. Uh, That's the short version. You yeah. didn't read the report. <laughs> Dr. Rowntree. Yeah, um, so easy question. It's easy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the risks that you kind of outline are worth taking seriously. Um, I think it's very hard to say the magnitude of how big yeah. the kind of issue will be, and I think, I think that's just something that's hard to know. But I do think it's worth taking seriously and thinking carefully about it. And again, I think from my, my view would be that, well, given that this, these changes in terms of the tax relief and having put, which then puts potential limitations on portability, given that they're not necessary to achieve the policy aim, I think for me that's why I would then be very cautious about making those changes and rather would look at other ways of achieving the same aim. Um, and, and in terms of the, the uh, portability as well, I, I think one thing that's kind of maybe worth adding to that is, you know, again, we're, we're thinking about a group here who we know don't pay particularly much attention to their financial affairs. That's why we want to default them into the pension system. But do we really want to be in a position whereby if they move around different employers that they end up having multiple different schemes? I think that's a real issue as well. So in terms of there's the portability issue, and because of that issue, do we want someone when they get to retirement to have three, four, five different schemes? Or do we want them to be... And, and, and if that is something which you know, the lack of portability exacerbates the risk of, I take that issue quite seriously. And that you know, we, don't, we don't want someone get, who, who hasn't paid much attention to their financial affairs over time coming to retirement and then having to go around to five different pension providers. I'm already, you know, I've done a PhD in economics, I'm already dreading having to go to two, right, and, and, and try from my time in the UK, go and get the details from that one and bring it over. So that, I, I, think, I think trying to minimise the amount of complexity there is, is important and a good uh, aim. Um, and, and, and so again, from, from the point of view of what you set out, I think it is worth thinking for those things seriously, but I, I don't think there is anything concrete we can say about how, how big an issue or the magnitude of that issue will be in the set. But isn't that potentially an attraction for auto-enrolment if you had the same level of tax relief in auto-enrolment as you have in an occupational pension? Because then with auto-enrolment, which allows you to move from employer to employer, you're not tied to any employer, you're not tied to any pension fund, and you get the same level of tax relief. So it actually might bring more people that are in potentially in occupational pensions into auto-enrolment as a result of that. Because, look, we do know now mm. people are going to end up in four or five jobs yeah. throughout their, their career, which is something that maybe was not an issue when auto-enrollment was established in the likes of the United States, maybe even the UK to a certain extent. And just the final comment then is no one projected the massive jump that we would ever see in workplace participation levels mm -hmm. over COVID. Mm. I think it was the SRI that said mm. this was, wouldn't happen yep. uh, in terms of the evidence that they provided to the Pension Commission. And we've seen a, a dramatic shift in a very short period of time. So... Isn't there a concern that if you start tinkering with this, you don't know what the fallout could be in terms of workforce participation 
if there isn't a need for it? And is that basically in plain English what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. so uh, again, I think with pension systems, they are so important and so complicated and operate over such a long horizon that there is a real virtue to being careful in how we proceed, right? And in that there is the potential for inadvertent consequences down the line and we don't want to have to go back and change the system again because, so, so from, from that point of view, I think what the Deputy is saying is, is, is correct. You want, you want to do these, you want to make changes to the pension system rarely and carefully and, and, uh, and, and from that point of view, again, it, it is, I think, important to think these, through, think, think these things through and be sure in what we're doing. Um, on the uh, participation rates, uh, yeah, I mean, during the COVID, I was particularly worried about, you know, permanently low levels of uh, participation um, and particularly amongst younger adults who were just, I think, you know, emerging from the Great Recession. And yet participation rates have shot right back up where, to where they were. And that is also the case across all age groups. I think it's really striking. Now, a caveat on that is that that's not what we're seeing in some other countries. In Britain and the US, rather, we're seeing actually lower rates of participation amongst kind of older workers, right? And we haven't seen that in Ireland, so we're seeing a very different... But, but for, for what that reason is, I think we're, we're not particularly sure. And I think there are some issues there. But, and that links to, I think, the, the question, I think, the, the, the second part of the, the, the question you had about sustainability. So, yes, I think there, there, there is a lot that can be done in terms of the sustainability of the pension system by having people working longer in kind of a flexible way, as you outline. However, I would be still quite, um, what, uh, I wouldn't be so sure that that is enough to eliminate the need for changes elsewhere in terms of... Yeah, no, we accept that. Exactly. Yeah. And, yes. and, and fairness, the committee reflected that in its report, that it was just one element of what could be yeah. done. But, but it is a significant element that shouldn't be ignored, I think, yes. the point the committee made.